This video is almost entirely brought to you by the extensive research and artwork done by Tyrannoraptorin on Twitter. Without their thread, this video wouldn't exist, so go follow them for more fascinating research documents. Spinosaurus, the spined reptile, is a mega theropod found in the dry desert wastes of Egypt and possibly Morocco. It was first uncovered from the Baharaya Desert of Egypt in the 1910s. It was unique even for the time, with the guy who found it, Ernst Stromer, really having to shave off bits to fit his fossils into the shape of a Tyrannosaurus. Here's that first specimen. It's a big chunk of lower jaw and a handful of backbones. A second, quite similar specimen was found in the 1930s, from the same area as the first. The second specimen had a lot of similarities and differences to the first, but since there really wasn't a lot of Spinosaurus fossils to compare and contrast, the second specimen was grouped together with the first, but was given the name of Spinosaurus B, until more remains of either could be found to settle what was what. Stromer thought it may represent a separate species. Spinosaurus B was some backbones and leg bones. Both of these specimens were taken back to a museum in Munich, Germany. They were promptly bombed into floor wax and ash during World War II. Any trace of Spinosaurus was lost, or at least mostly lost. The rest of the century saw only bits and pieces of the spined reptile turning up in fossil markets and in grody outcrops. The entire group is unusually elusive as well, and research on the Spinosaurus would slowly trudge along, adding older specimens like Baryonyx to the mix, or finding diamonds in the rough like Suchomimus. Until, as the story goes, 2014 and the publication and announcement of a much more complete new specimen of Spinosaurus uncovered this time from the arid sediments of Morocco. It was given neotype status. The first specimen found is called the holotype. For Spinosaurus, this is the holotype. A neotype is a specimen found later that is as good or better than the first specimen and can be lumped into the earlier found specimen. So, the new 2014 Spinosaurus specimen is the neotype. This neotype has neck, back, and some tail vertebrae, plus some leg bones, neural spines, some ribs, and some skull bones. Then, more of that first specimen was found. That was the tail discovery published in 2020. The new specimen revolutionized the very notion of what Spinosaurus was. It was no longer the baryonyx with a sail from Jurassic Park, nor the lumbering and newt-sailed creature from Planet Dinosaur. It was something altogether different. After this new discovery, more Spinosaur specimens were found and combined with some fragmentary finds from years past. All were lumped into the Spinosaurus aegyptiacus species name. The reality of the situation is far more complex than this. On top of that, the situation is also way spottier than you or I realize. Spinosaurus may be some of you's favorite dinosaur, but it's on incredibly shaky ground, and exactly what it looks like, or how many there are, probably won't be figured out for quite some time. Makes being a Tyrannosaurus fan look pretty good right now. Recombobulating Spinosaurus Alrighty folks, we have a lot of work to do. For starters, the material which we can call Spinosaurus aegyptiacus is only the stuff from Egypt. That's the holotype stuff. Everything else is too unique to simply slap on the label of Spinosaurus aegypticus. Some could probably still be under the Spinosaurus label, while others might not even be Spinosaurus. The neotype from Morocco really doesn't have enough data preserved in the fossils to confidently slap on the label of Spinosaurus aegypticus. It should really just be considered Spinosaurus SP. That SP being the abbreviation of species, since they cannot be put in a species category with confidence, but can be put in the genus category with confidence. In other words, it is more than likely a Spinosaurus, but which Spinosaurus is uncertain. The holotype and neotype being from different regions wouldn't inherently count them as separate animals, However, when these animals were alive, Africa was split in two. Sure, there were islands between them, 
but they were effectively two unique landmasses. This geographical range may mean nothing, especially since these animals are suggested to live in coastal deltas. Crocodiles travel hundreds or thousands of miles over a lifetime, so it's not out of the question. It is noteworthy to keep the geographical separation of the two specimens in mind. This wasn't the first time the exact relationships of Spinosaurus specimens have been debated. A Brazilian Spinosaur known from just the very tip of the snout, Oxalaya, and another Moroccan Spinosaur known from some very fragmentary fossils, Sigilmasasaurus, have been argued over for many years as to whether they might belong to the Spinosaurus genus. Paleontologist most known for his dinosauroid hypothesis, Dale Russell, named Sigilmasasaurus brevicalis on a single neck vertebra. He then grouped about 15 other vertebrae from the same layer of rock into the Sigilmasasaurus label. Russell then named another specimen of tail vertebrae Sigilmasasaurus II. He thought that maybe the Spinosaurus B material was a transition between the two Sigilmasasaurus specimens. Thanks to the 2014 specimen and subsequent research, all Sigilmasasaurus material was thrown into the Spinosaurus genus and Spinosauridae family. Unfortunately for Nizar Ibrahim's work, there's a distinct lack of overlap between all of these specimens. The logic that any North African Spinosaur specimen that cannot be confidently identified as Spinosaurus is therefore Sigilmasasaurus is extremely flawed. There was a ping pong game after 2014 of one author team after another, finding that Sigilmasasaurus isn't Spinosaurus, is Spinosaurus, is actually made up of bones from other unrelated dinosaurs, and so on and so on. The fact of the matter is that the remains given the name Sigilmasasaurus cannot be cleanly lumped into the Spinosaurus genus, and should therefore lie outside it. Exactly what Sigilmasasaurus is, if anything at all, remains to be seen. It's an outlier Spinosaur we should keep track of. You may have seen this image before. It's a privately owned specimen, which is actually composed of a few skull bones and a lot of plaster and clay. It's what's called a composite, for it's composited of different fossils, with all the gaps filled in. It's often mislabeled as a Sigilmasasaurus skull, or even as a Spinosaurus skull. At least some parts of this specimen are legitimate fossils, but what they belong to is out of anyone's hands. It's not impossible that some of the bones in this specimen belong to the same type of animal to which the neck bones of Sigilmasasaurus belong. But there's no bones to compare, and no overlap between the specimens, so both of these specimens remain outliers. Let's beat a dead Oxalaya. Spinosaurs are known from South America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. During the time of the Spinosaurs, the early to late Cretaceous, South America had not yet attached to North America, and was way closer to Africa. This allowed for Spinosaurs to traverse the relatively short length of ocean between the continents. Though I'm sure there were already Spinosaurs or Protospinosaurs on South America as it drifted away from Africa. In 1999, some fossils were recovered from a site called Laje do Coringa, which spits out fossils from the Alcantara Formation. This sandy sediment sandwich spat out the tip of the snout and a fragment of jaw from a Spinosaur. This Spinosaur was about 100 to 93 million years old, placing it within the same time frame of Spinosaurus. This new South American guy would be named Oxalaya quilombensis. Later, some vertebrae would be found and lumped into the Oxalaya label, but would then be burned to ash in a series of Brazilian museum fires. This South American Spinosaur lies on very shaky ground. Some researchers lump it into the Spinosaurus aegypticus species, while others leave it as Spinosaurus sp, and others have made it a new species of Spinosaurus, so Spinosaurus quilombensis. Considering how minuscule the remains of our pal Oxalaya are, any conclusion on lumping it with Spinosaurus shouldn't even enter the conversation. The non-skull material, which was lost, was only thrown in with Oxalaya because Oxalaya is the only known large Spinosaur from the area and time, which means that even the now lost fossils are in contention. We can leave Oxalaya aside as yet another indeterminable outlier. 
If you've been enjoying this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Oh, oh the morphotypes. What makes the situation worse is the presence of what's called morphotypes. A morphotype is any of a group of different forms within the same species in a given population. Like how there are a bunch of subspecies of black bear throughout North and Central America, despite all belonging to the same species of black bear, Ursus americanus. Each specimen of Spinosaur from Africa is different from one another, yet are all placed somewhere in and around Spinosaurus. So, what are those types, and can they be relied on as a classification system? Spines Slender morph spines. Here we have four bones which represent a slender spined morphotype. The largest spiniest of these spines is partially reconstructed. All have a very similar base. Where they belong in the spine is pretty much unknown, but some researchers have suggested they might fit in the center or back of the spine. These type of spines can be found in public and private collections, but remain unstudied and unpublished. Robust Morph Spines These guys are spines that are disturbingly wider than the usual Spinosaurus spines. They are significantly wider than anything from the Spinosaurus holotype and the neotype. As they don't belong to those other known specimens, their placement in the spinal column is also a mystery. Some folks have speculated they may fit into the middle of the spine. Just like the slender spines, the robust spines are unpublished and unstudied, and also remain in both private and public collections. Egypticus morph spines. These are the spines that are unique to the original holotype specimen. The similarity between the shape of the spines in the holotype and neotype was used as a reasoning to lump them together. It's true that some of the spines of the neotype more closely resemble those of the holotype than any of these other types I'm going through. There's apparently an isolated specimen found elsewhere at a different time from the holotype and neotype that does resemble these Egypticus type spines, but not much else is known about it. Quadrates. Now we take a look at the only other known parts of these dinosaur skeletons. First, let's take a look at the quadrate bones a bone that helps form part of the skull that articulates with the lower jaw, the lower jaw joint. There are three known quadrate morphotypes. Morphotype 1 is the one traditionally lumped into Spinosaurus. They have an inflated front sheet of bone and slightly curved backside. Morphotype 2 is traditionally incorrectly assigned to Sigilmasasaurus and is less bow-shaped. It's more shapeless. The neotype, Ibrahim's 2014 Morocco skeleton, has a unique quadrate morphotype. It is most similar to morphotype 1, but is still a bit different. Cervicals. There really aren't a lot of Spinosaurus neck fossils known to science. In the case of Spinosaurus, there are two distinct morphotypes, plus the neotype's fossils. Morphotype 1 is the traditional Spinosaurus morph, while morphotype 2 is that applied to Sigilmasasaurus. The second morphotype is so unique that the neck bones were used as the main basis for naming Sigilmasasaurus in the first place. Since Spinosaur neck bones are so rare, their anatomy is not well understood. They shouldn't, therefore, be used to make assertions on relationships among the known Spinosaurs. Jaws There are two jaw morphotypes which have been given the names of slender and robust. Both morphs are difficult to really parse out from the known Spinosaurus fossils because a lot of them remain in private collections and or are partially reconstructed, obscuring their original appearances. Even with these caveats, there does appear to be some vague, slender versus robust morph going on. Orbits Orbit is just the anatomical word for eye socket. In the case of African Spinosaurs, we're looking at a chunk of bone that makes up the prefrontal, frontal, postorbital, and parietal bones. This guy right here. There are currently two morphs known. Morphotype A, the elevated orbit, and Morphotype B, the non-elevated orbit. Morphotype A is assigned to Spinosaurus and B to Sigilmasasaurus. However, this assignment was based on nothing but size, so should be thrown out altogether. Many past researchers have reasoned their lumping of all these differences together under the Spinosaurus roof with the phenomenon of individual variation. 
That being the fact that not every single individual of a given species, especially throughout relatively small chunks of geologic time, will look exactly alike. But is the idea of differences among members of the same species really a good explanation for the many differences seen among the very small sample size of African Spinosaurs? Individual Variation Time Authority it's pretty damn difficult to explain away all the described differences among Spinosaur fossils as individual variation, when there isn't a consensus on what the hell Spinosaurus aegypticus even is. No one can agree on what the range of variation is. It makes it difficult to accept when the suggested variation among individuals is as strong as it appears to be, if we're going to accept the latest findings, of course. Here's the deal. Morphs are common among dinosaurs. Critters like Tyrannosaurus and Coelophysis have been given morphs based on distinct differences in groups of skeletons. The big difference here is that Coelophysis has near 100 or more specimens to its name, and Tyrannosaurus over 20 at this point. They have relatively huge sample sizes. Styracosaurus, the sunburst frilled dinosaur, has such a high number of skeletons to its name that a wide range of individual variation is known and proven for it. You cannot say that for Spinosaurus. It's difficult to try and use the individual variation excuse on Spinosaurus when the range of that variation is unknown due to a lack of enough specimens to have a reasonable sample size to test with. Look at this chart. It's a spectrum which plots all the known vertebral spines of Spinosaurus and Spinosaur-like Spinosaurs from Africa. There's a huge range of variation from slender at one end to robust at the other. I already explained the differences among them, but here you can see how drastic the changes are. Under the current explanation of Spinosaurus relationships, this level of variation is common among the species. But can it really represent the spines of individuals of the same genus and species? Or is there a hard line between what is and isn't a Spinosaurus? Where should that line even be drawn? Should it? Tale of the Sail this discussion is important for the reconstruction of these animals. Recent speculations among researchers and paleoartists is that the wide range of individual variations supposed for Spinosaurus would mean a whole assortment of sail shapes and dimorphism among the sexes or among regions. These are unfortunately completely unfounded and more to do with artistic liberty and differing reconstructions due to the paucity of the fossil resources. There are slender and robust morph Spinosaurs, and then there's the only confirmed Spinosaurus. The robust morph, here, is based on the robust morph spines that are thick at their bases and flare out at their tips. They remain undescribed and mostly in private collections, never to see the light of day. They are somewhat comparable to the Egyptian holotype specimen, but are obviously significantly wider. The angle and shape of these spines would significantly alter the shape of the overall sail of the animal. But since no one knows where these spines are in the spinal column, every reconstruction using these spines is partially speculative. The composite Sigilmassosaurus skull is here used as the basis for the skull of this morph, though even this is entirely speculative since no single skull, besides the holotype and neotype, can be connected to any known skeletal material. Here is the slender morph Spinosaur. This reconstruction uses the slender backwards pointing spines of the slender spine morph and the more conventionally Spinosaurus material. Some reconstructions using these long slender spines combined with more traditional spines exist, but appear unnatural and exaggerated with the required change from wide flat paddle shaped spines to these toothpick spines. Finally, we are left with the only thing which can be confirmed to belong to Spinosaurus aegypticus, that being the fossils from Egypt, the holotype, and the holotype only. It is most likely that the Spinosaurus B material also belongs to Spinosaurus aegypticus, as it shares the most similarities with the holotype material. This is the sail, which results in the M shape with the lower jaw that bulges into a rounded tip. Though the exact arrangement of the spines in the spinal column cannot be confirmed due to the, you know, bombing, this overall kind of arrangement seems the most likely. This doesn't complicate the situation more, in fact it simplifies it. Trying to squeeze all known African Spinosaur fossils into Spinosaurus aegypticus is the thing which makes the whole situation complicated. 
So, we've gone through all the known material of Spinosaurus. What does it mean? Diversity. The only reliably Spinosaurus material is from Egypt. This means that all others are very closely related Spinosaurs, but are either new species of Spinosaurus or separate genera. There is at least some evidence that there was a greater diversity of Spinosaurs across Africa and into South America than previously thought. You have at least three types of Spinosaur in the northwestern section of Africa, and the true Spinosaurus aegypticus in the northeastern half of Africa. Several species of large carnivore coexisting in the same region is not unheard of, and occurs with relative frequency in the fossil record as well as in today's ecosystems. The Spinosaurus mess isn't really the mess it is made out to be. Rather, it's a complex of different critters interacting in the same regions. Hopefully this mindset may allow further research to better nitpick the Spinosaur fossils coming out of Africa. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, and Arda Bayer, as well as my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Admin.